Please welcome your panelists for Private Equity, <coughs> Creating Value Against Increased Competition. Moderated by Managing Director and Group Head of Leveraged Finance Group at BMO Capital Markets, Jim Moglia. So good morning. Um, I also want to thank the Milken Institute for introducing me. Um, I found when I have subjects that are particularly exciting, I forget to tell anybody in the room who I am and where I work. Uh, so um, we're going to come back to the subject in a second, but I want to first introduce our panelists today. Uh, certainly worth uh, the time, if not four or five times the time we have this morning to talk to cover the subject. Over on my far right, Virginie Morgon from, uh, she's a CEO of Eurozio. Um, and then to my direct right, John uh, Rutolo, who is head of private equity um, and real assets at Barings. To my left, Scott Sperling, who's co-president, co-chairman of uh, TH Lee. David Wasserman, uh, to his left, at Clayton Dubelier, he's a partner there. And then at the far end, on my, my far left, is Andrew Weinberg, who's founder and managing partner at Bright Star Capital Partners. So um, fact is, uh, I had started at Drexel Burnham a long time ago and worked with Mike. And at that time, and for much of my career, I was extremely excited that I was a founder of, of one of the transitional products in capital markets and capitalism. And I have to say humbly that the private equity business of the various types has really, uh, despite maybe giving some credit to high yield bonds, et cetera, for being part of their founding, has really changed significantly what's going on in our world and will be a significant part of what goes on into the future. Any capitalist will tell you that we create social value by moving money to people that know what to do with that money and, and, then, uh, and where to put that money. And I'm very proud today that these five, as well as some of the others that you'll meet at the conference, are significant catalysts to the movement of money to where it makes the most sense. Now, uh, that's the good news. One of the things we're going to talk about today is, is maybe some of the, the tough parts of that job. And I want to direct uh, everybody to slide number one. Uh, this slide, we have it up, shows what happens when you deliver for your investors is your investors want to reinvest and more investors want to put money in with you. So there's been a significant amount of private uh, equity fundraising. This is the fundraising for the LBO side of the business, but it's much wider if you go beyond just LBOs. If you go to slide number two, this is one of the things that people are becoming concerned about, which is, has there been a buildup of dry powder out in the marketplace? And, you know, you don't have to get beyond second grade to know that your mom would tell you that money burns a hole in your pocket. So does money burn a hole in their pocket? We'll have to examine that a little bit more. And then I'll take you to slide number three. And slide number three shows what's been happening to purchase multiples uh, for acquisitions in the marketplace. Obviously, there's a, there's a desire to try to find causality that if you give these guys more money and gals more money, then eventually they bid up the prices of everything to crazy levels. And, uh, and there's a, a decent uh, case that uh, that's worth examining. Uh, I want to go to a headline uh, that brings that up. Is there too much dry powder? Too few deals. This is a headline from Private Equity Spotlight. Really hits the subject of the day. Oddly enough, that's from September 2013. So this seems to be a subject that's been hot for a long time. Um, so perhaps the way to start this is I think that there is a, a, a combination of subjects. One is, is too much money, too few deals, a problem. But most importantly, how do our panelists today uh, drive value creation, uh, value proposition, so that they'll prove out that it's not the case that they should be feared when they are liquid. Um, and maybe with that, I want to go back to a quote that Scott here should be responsible for back in March 2010. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, so this <laughs> may be a hard exercise for you. We need to be careful that we do not push pricing beyond what makes sense. All right, Scott. <laughs> How's that doing for you? You can tell it's great. It's working out great. Uh, you know, look, I, I, let me start with the good news. The good news is I've been doing this for about 37 years. And during the entirety of that period, the headline that you stated from 2013 
has been a headline at least every other year, that there's always too much money chasing too few deals. And yet, over very long periods of time, private equity has provided a level of sustainable performance that has been uh, in, uh, significantly higher, in fact, than almost any other asset class that one can invest in. So I think over a longer period of time, the industry has done a very good job of adapting to the supply and demand dynamics that have occurred and have provided those longer term returns, three, five, 10, and 20 years, well in excess of any of the public markets or even other private asset classes. That's the good news. The bad news is obviously in any given uh, year or any uh, uh, couple of years, you can see excess occur as the industry transitions to respond to what has gone on. And we do have to be very careful about uh, all the reasons that we can come up with about why paying very high multiples for businesses that have sustainable growth rates that are significantly lower as a percentage than the multiple that we're paying for those businesses. And that is one of the things that I think was problematic in the middle of the last decade and one of the things that we have to be careful about today. There is an intrinsic value long term to businesses. That intrinsic value, we believe, is related to the sustainable growth rate of that business, at least in terms of the nature of the cash flow and the nature of the business model. At any point in time, market comps, whether they're public market comps or private market acquisition comps, can be well in excess of that. And that will help determine what the pricing is that one's willing to pay. The industry has responded to that partly by looking for growthier things. So I think as you look at the nature of the sectors that the industry has invested in, we've migrated to growthier sectors so that we can find companies that have higher sustainable growth rates. And the belief over the last 15 years that we can add significant value operationally to companies in order to accelerate the growth rate of the company that we bought and help make it a better company. You know, CDNR has been doing that for a very long time. It was part of, you know, back to Marty Duvalier's concept of the company. Most of us have created operating groups that we believe can uh, add that value at this point. But, and I think that generally has worked. But nonetheless, you look at those charts and you say, this is a time to be particularly careful as you see that creep up in the uh, purchase price multiple. Disciplined. <laughs> so David, maybe I'm gonna go to you next. Pretty much the same subject, but one of the things that, that, that uh, your firm gets a lot of write-ups about is the ability to make EBITDA happen. And, he, and making EBITDA happen goes a long way to making multiples at the purchase date seem a whole lot smaller when you're exiting. So why don't you go through that for us a bit? Well, look, look I agree a lot with what uh, Scott just said. I think, and, I, and what I'll say is, look, no operating capability will fix really out, you know, overpaying for a business. But the advantages that private equity has in the marketplace and will continue to have in the marketplace is that it's incredibly flexible and creative capital. It's patient capital and it's active capital, right? We can be actively involved in our businesses. And especially in today's world, we have this bifurcated world where public equities are moving mainly towards indexed investing, right, which is incredibly passive, where trading is happening through an algorithm, right? If you think about the, the way we invest and the capabilities we have, we can play a very powerful role in investing. Not to say that people won't make mistakes today, right, in a, in a place where you pay high multiples and where where there's more, there's a lot of supply of capital, but there's extreme opportunities to, uh, still a lot of opportunities to make money. And if you just think about, you, know, you think about corporations that want to divest businesses, right? We can play an enormous role in that. You think about a family that wants to transition ownership, right? That's a place where private equity can play a really important role. You think about a company that's got some innovative product but doesn't want to be public yet, but needs capital, right? And wants to build out a team Right, a lot of what you know, Scott's firm does, you know, we can play a really important role there. Or a company that wants to make an acquisition and doesn't want to source the public markets, right? So increasingly, you know, we're not just a little business anymore. Private, private capital can play so many different roles in the marketplace to drive value. And obviously, as, as was mentioned, one of them is post-investment and how we can interact with companies post-investment, how we can bring the best governance to a business, like I, I always say, one you know we have a huge advantage in private equity, in that when we buy a business, right, we start with us and the management team 
on the starting line together, right? Everyone's got options at the same place. Mm. You're right, you know, bought stock and have options at the same place. We all have a three, five, seven year time horizon. And we're trying to think about how to make a business great. You know, for all of you who've been in public companies, some of you work in banks that are public, some of you, you know, work in corporations that are public, think about how much more complicated life is there, right? Everyone's got options and got different motivations and things at different places, right? Whereas in our business, we have this huge advantage, right, that we start to, at the very beginning. And then we can add operating talent and real governance to that, right? We can apply, you know, in our firm, and we have the benefit of having guys like Jack Welsh and Jim McNerney and you know, other Terry Leahy and other great leaders that we can apply to a billion dollar business. You know, when, how often do those guys really go spend time in their old career, right? They spent time on $50 billion businesses, but now we can go buy a billion or two or $3 billion businesses. And these guys can be intimately involved in trying to think about how to help grow that business. So those are huge advantages in today's world that will, I think will allow private equity continue to outperform. Now, as, as Scott said, there will be mistakes made now. To me, it feels a little bit like 2006. It's not quite, you know, the really heady peak. And we're not all going to benefit. We, you know, we all look like geniuses over the last six, seven years, right? Because you could buy a business at eight times, then you could sell at 10, then you could buy it at 10, you could sell it 12 times, you could buy it at 12. And today, you could sell it at 14 times. Mm -hmm. But the question is, you know, when you go buy a business at 14 times, they Yep. What's going to happen, right? And so you got, but so you got to be smart and you got to be thoughtful. You got to think about how to be creative and using your capital, not just to buy a business at a high price, but help solve a problem, solve a solve a solution for someone, and maybe do an innovative transaction. And we can talk more about that as we go on. Well, one of the things uh, is you know at CDNR where you guys have, I think in the past, argued or or claimed with with a lot of uh, evidence that. But 80 percent of your value creation is an EBITDA, even if you're buying a company at 14 times. If you're exiting north of 10, you're coming out with your money because of the operational improvements. I want to turn to slide six to, to point out uh, a little bit of, of what we discussed at the beginning here. So this would be the number of public companies that are listed um, in the U.S. And you see a, pretty much a halving over the last 15, 20 years as that money has gone to places that are more patient and, and bring more active management. And if you look at the companies that are still public, uh, where the, 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 there's a significant amount of the public markets that are now passive index funds, ETFs, et cetera. So private equity is becoming the one place where you can put your money uh, for a longer period of time uh, where active management is still important. So I want to go to Virginie a bit and, and have her address the general question, but also uh, Eurozio has been um, advantaged by patient capital. You guys have been around, you know, through family for 130 years, and the way you're structured today gives you an angle that perhaps is missing in the public markets generally. Yeah. I look uh, way younger than 130 <laughs> years ago. Um, yeah, I think our industry, um, A, we became an industry. Uh, we're the largest employer in mature markets in the US and in Europe. Um, and time is long gone since we were, some of us were just making the money on higher leverage and you know, just cash flow of the companies. I think we, we can be proud of what we bring to companies in, you know, across, across the globe because as we've pointed out, we have long-term capital. Um, that's how Eurasia was born historically. Um, ambition, uh, expertise, um, transformation. We're working on build-ups, digitalization, going more global. And I think you can, you can support management team in their own ambition to conquer the sort of the world and be very disruptive because you have access to this amazing pool of talents and capital at the same time. And you're seeing the world from you know, a, a big perspective because we are collectively investors across the board, across industries, across sizes also of companies. Very interesting to be very early on, which we do at Eurasil. So we are a venture investor up to you know, way bigger companies, <coughs> like multinational type of companies. So permanent, I mean, the way I see the industry going in the future, unless, you know, something big happens and change the world again, I think you'll see a lot of convergence between permanent capital and third party money. Th this is happening as we speak. So you've got long-term investors, the pension funds, 
um, the sovereign funds, the family offices as well are getting way more professionalized, hiring people from our industry and willing to invest through GPs, but also through their own, you know, their own team. So this is happening as we speak. Um, it's, it's likely to, to evolve and converge in the next years. There will be more public private equity companies. There's already a number of us. Either we were born public, that's the case of Eurasio, and then progressively we've grown into being the partner of reference of European, French first, and then European, and now American companies. But I think our industry has to become more global. It's maybe sort of a bit counterintuitive to say that, but when you look at our industry, 95% of the players are domestic. You know, amazing, super strong, super connected. Um, in China, I see some of my friends on the first row, in China, in Europe, in the US. And it's only a handful of players who have become very global, and we, we know their name, you know, they're top of mind. But our companies have to be global day one. You know, the small ones, the bigger ones. There's very few industries where you can only think of your country on a domestic basis. And that's an enormous change from 2005 or 2007. So I think, I mean, we're, we're sort of mid-sized mid, mid players here around the table. And mm. what we all try to do is to become global and be able to support our you know, companies, our investment, in a more global approach, sometimes you know going global, opening offices you know in, in other countries, sometimes you know having partners locally, and you have to be innovative in that, and that's what we've mentioned earlier. You have to make it happen with your own tools, <laughs> and you know partnering. You know we've got a number of partners in China because most of our investments hospitality, consumer, luxury, for of course education. You have to be Chinese you know, base and, and grow in China and the best way is either you're local and strong or you have local partners. And I think this industry will be, you know, will surprise you going forward by becoming even more professional in the way we adapt to how our companies have to adapt themselves to this uh, amazingly changing world that we are facing, which is volatile, uncertain, you know, stressed, uh, a, a big stressful environment. But what we provide as long-term capital or, you know, is, is that ambition and that vision of the world. I think this is an exciting time to be an investor. I think 2006 and 2007 were very different times. It's probably the same amount of dry powder. Um, for me, the big difference is that you've got three big engines producing growth, US, continental Europe, and China. That's an enormous difference for our companies that we are, we are, you know, we're supporting. Well, I think... Uh the one thing you, you bring up is the the upside or the future of more interactivity, the community of, of private equity being integrated more rather than being silos and different Absolutely. investment opportunities. And if you look at uh, back in, uh, in telecom and, and the value of networks, the value of a network goes up at the square of the number of members in that network. So if you think of the financial sponsor private equity community as a group of members of a network, as they begin to talk to each other and contribute towards each other, the value of that entire asset class actually starts to go up uh, geometrically. So John, there are a couple of things that uh, um, the trend that we've been covering through the, the panel uh, intro has been a little bit of going longer term, and, and Barings is a firm that has longer term capital capability. And then as I just introduced maybe, um, the, the integration of different products or of different mindsets towards making value greater. Um, talk to us a bit about, uh, about both of those at your shop. Yeah, sure. No, so um, a, a lot of things that the, the panels hit on, um, really, really relevant to the things that we're talking about um, every day, I guess. But first, um, you know, I think just going back to slide two, I think it's a really interesting slide in that there's, there's something key that's, that's missing there. Um, and um, it's obviously one of the bigger trends in, in private equity, and that's co-investment. And so when you think about the sort of shadow capital that's out there on the sidelines waiting to support investments um, alongside these fund commitments, it's, it's, a, it's a really meaningful amount of, of capital. And so that's something we're spending a lot of time thinking about is how, how big really is the industry um, and how do, we, 
how do we think about taking advantage of that? Um, so I guess in terms of um, globalization, I think it's it's one of the more exciting things that we're dealing with every day. And so we really have a two-pronged approach. So the first is thinking globally, but then also a real local to local um, approach. And depending on what the business is or what the assets are that you own, you really need to have that local to local um, presence um, to be able to effectively manage those assets. But you still need the top-down overlay um, to make sure that you're getting best practices applied across um, territories and that you're taking advantage of, of all the opportunities. Um, for us, the, um, you know, sort of the ability to work across different asset types together really is driven by that um, idea of networks. And so a lot of the investment theses that we're thinking about are network driven. Um, a great example <coughs> at Bearings, we've, um, in my team, we've been very active in the logistics space, so we own a number of businesses that are providing services or logistics equipment um, within the U.S. economy where there's a very significant trend happening driven by the Amazon effect, changing how um, goods flow throughout the U.S. and who's um, involved in that flow of goods. We also have a very substantial real estate uh, business at Bearings, and so obviously um, the industrial part of the real estate business is, um, is also being exposed to those same themes, and so we're doing a lot of work together across the real estate team, the private equity team, and trying to think about how can we leverage our platform to deliver better solutions to the large companies in that space. So for example, can we go to a UPS or a FedEx and say, not only can we deliver trailers containers, lease airplanes, but we can also provide new build or logistics facilities that are in our portfolio today, and how can we do that on an in an integrated way to help them achieve the outcome that they're doing. So I think thinking about where those, where those networks have need for capital and trying to be creative and, and flexible as private equity investors are um, is a really, you know, it's a fun part of the job right now. And you have, you have some business and intangible assets, right? We do. Um, so. Historically, about a third of our portfolio roughly has been um, investments in intellectual property-based assets or, or businesses, which would cover the media space. So think about film and television, music copyrights. Um, we've accumulated over the last 10 years probably the largest independently held catalog of music rights. It includes over 4,000 um, rights of everything from the Sound of Music, to Michael Jackson, to Creedence Clearwater Revival, some, some amazing things in there. Um, and then we've also been active in the, the technology space and the pharmaceutical sector as well in, in intellectual property-based investments. As a, as a financier type person, you know, I've always had some interest in intangible assets, but I've sure. tried to avoid what turned out to be intangible liabilities <laughs> when companies didn't do as well as I was hoping. Okay, so Andrew, you know, a lot of the caricature of the financial sponsor world is uh, private equity world is they're the big guy and the management kind of is a little guy. So it's a kind of a me and mini me relationship. But you guys uh, and your fund and, and your strategy is an, an us and us relationship. And as we've gone through the panel into extending the whole period um, as, as maybe a trend that we're seeing um, over at Bright Star, Bright Star, your whole period becomes maybe as long as necessary, because you're really partnering up, right, with families and entrepreneurs? Well, I'd say this, and, and I'll give you a little bit of an approach. We, um, for those that don't know us, um, newer fund just closed in over $700 million in our uh, fund, first fund program. Um, we very much take the us and us model. Um, we've, we've learned a lot from the market that the middle market company in the U.S. oftentimes cares um, as much about values as valuation. And when you look at the number of public companies, you've seen 7,000 go to 4,000. Well, there are 3,000 companies that are private or got consolidated. In the market we play in, there are 32,000 private companies, roughly, about 16 times as many as public companies. Um, and when we sit down to talk about the proposition of being partners, it starts with the need for a capital partner, and then it goes beyond that. <coughs> we talk about how we can help grow the company together and we talk about the capabilities of our partners, many of whom started life in operations, uh, C-level executives, some of those iconic companies, similar to the ones you referenced, uh, David, and um, some of us started in finance and learned how to become an operator. 
And we think having that dialogue um, with that middle market company, which sometimes gets forgotten in that mix, and being that first institutional capital, we think there's a chance to do some great things together. We do think, though, it's important not to overstay our welcome. So once we've accomplished our mission, achieved the objectives, we do think there are other sources of capital, other companies uh, who might uh, admire those companies, uh, maybe have a different cost of capital. So we think we play a, a part of that process. I think all of us play a role in that entire process. Um, and I do think when you look, let's say, at a top level, 25 to $30 trillion of wealth transfer in the next 20 to 30 years from those middle market companies to their heirs. Right, add up all the capital in this stage, we're a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the need for that. But I think the private markets have become relatively developed to address those needs. Okay. Yeah, Jim, I was just going to say, you know, it's obvious with, with those charts that you show that show all that capital flowing in, is that obviously a lot of, not only dollar capital has flowed in, but a lot of intellectual capital has flowed into the private equity world. I mean, it's very different than it was 20, 30 years ago. And so you think about the amount of talent, financial talent, operating talent, not just at CDNR, but across all the different firms. You think about the global capabilities of firms. And so the, the ways that are the private capital can add value in the marketplace today is so much greater than it was 20 or 30 years ago, the innovation that guys are doing. And you know what I find, too, is that we tend not even to compete. Sure, there are moments of like big competitiveness, but if I think about my career 10 or 15 years ago, I, mean, I used to run into Tom Lee all the time, or I used to run into the same, you know, I'd be, every part I'd go to, I'd see the same four or five guys showing up, right? <clears throat> That's not really true as much today. People have really tailored their strategies around where people need capital and how to supply capital in a way that's different. And so I think it's, again, an evolution of the business, of you know, the intellectual capital in the business, the way the strategies of the business, the capability set of the business has really changed. And again, not to say the industry won't make mistakes. We will. But, but we're at a different point in our life cycle today than clearly we were 10 or 15 years ago. And then you compare that to the public market investors Right, where, as I said before, m most of them, you know, think about all the money managers you knew at Fidelity, right? I mean, many of them are gone, right? And it's now passive run money. And even the hedge fund community, which has so many great, how much great talent, but you know, that's been a hard place to invest too. And a lot of talent has left that industry. And so you, you just think about the opportunities that exist in private capital today. It's, it's going to be a, it continue to be a very meaningful part of, of you know, the world capital markets. Yeah, and you're, you're, way, you know, you're way better supported by your private owner to make the, you know, the big move, the bold move, than if, if you're a public co co publicly quoted company. We all know that. Um, you don't go to a public market once you're, you know, you have to be really ready for this. I mean, in the U.S., you can be private easier, you know, come out of the markets, but in some countries, in Europe, as an example, once you're public, you're very likely to remain public for a long period of time. It's extremely difficult to delist a company, so things may change. But I think, you know, the entrepreneur and management team, they know that well supported by long term capital, you can be bold and make, you know, the big change, you know, the big movements which are game changing for your company in a way sort of more comfortable, you know, environment than if you're a public company by far. Well, some of my worst personal investments turned out to be very long-term capital. And while it was... <laughs> so there. <laughs> and I'm not sure what they were doing with my money while they had it. But I think uh, <laughs> if you got the money for a bit of time, you have a responsibility to make something happen. I think the... Uh, David, you have the two-by-two two or the Noah's Ark thing you've referenced in, in, in the past. You guys have it. Scott, you have the Strategic Resources Group. Could you guys... If you go back 15 years ago, I'm sure there were less operating partners uh, on, uh, you know, as part of your Rolodex. They were, it was less the business back then when it was financial engineering. Can you both talk about sure. that part, you, well, starting with you, Scott? One of the things that we found starting in the late 90s when we bought companies ranging from what's now called Experian, but at the time TRW's credit business, to a Houghton Mifflin or Warner Music and the various parts of the uh, media world, is that we were buying a really good asset in an industry that had uh, <coughs> very attractive characteristics to it, but we, where we fundamentally needed to turn over the business plan of the uh, company and elements of the business model in order to take full advantage of the opportunities the industry itself presented, 
and that were inherent within the strength of the asset that we were buying. And I would say that our, our own experience was that we applied that to about half the things back in the late 90s that we did, and we always utilized people who are in our broader network, but were not employees, to execute against that strategy. And those turned out to be very successful approaches to investing. And so by the time you fast forward to the early part or mid part of the 2000s, we had decided that not only uh, would our historical strength of sourcing be an advantage, but for lots of reasons, the world, in terms of the intensity of competition, was such that we wanted to be able to add value operationally to these companies as we had done with a handful of our uh, investments. And so we brought in-house that capability with a focus on hiring people into it who would be treated just like our investment professionals, would be compensated just like our in prof uh, investment professionals, and would work hand in hand on deal teams, but their job was to help companies identify projects that we think would significantly improve the key business processes of the company, allowing it to improve its competitive position and advantage and therefore accelerate both revenue growth and improve the efficiency of the business model. Those are all lots of nice fancy words, but what it really means is you need people at companies working with managers, helping them think outside of the box of their industry, so bringing the experience base that we have looking across lots of businesses to bear on that company with a real focus on implementation. We can all pontificate with CEOs about what great strategy is, but what it really comes down to is being able to understand how you would implement those big thoughts into something that will make a difference at the uh, market level of in which that company participates. And so over the course of the last um, now almost dozen years, this has become a major focus of our firm and that part of our firm has grown very significantly. And you know, it's now hard to think back to a time that we didn't have that capability. But it wasn't always a natural thought for people coming out of private equity uh, like us where the, the, the biggest thought was how do we uh, figure out how we can source deals such that we don't have to fully rely on the auction market. We're not against auctions, but it just happens we lose a lot. So we need to have an alternative uh, uh, deal sourcing. And where our thought was always that management is our key partner. And management is a key partner. And oftentimes it is the management you enter the deal with. But sometimes it's the management that you can bring in to effectuate the changes that I've just talked about. David, CDNR, same, or is there a different angle on that? Well, Scott said, you know, we grew up this way. So our firm was founded by Marty Dublier and Joe Rice. We, so we had an operating guy and a finance guy. That's the reference to Noah's Ark. I would say we walk two by two wherever we go, right? We're always, we're always combined in what we do. But yeah, the, but the world, again, has changed a lot. And, you know, if you think about 20 years ago, it was a lot about cost cutting, right? Could you, take, could you buy a business and take margins from 5% to 10% and make money that way? And that game still exists at times, but that's not enough, right, to win. And so a lot of what our operating guys and partners do now is think about how do we innovate and how do we really grow the top line, right? So what, what new markets can we attack? What new products can we get into? How do we drive growth in the business? And that's, you know, both strategic, but it's also how do you build great teams? And so our operating partners spend a lot of time trying to think about when we buy a business, right, job number one is how do we make sure we have the best team there possible? Even if we have a good CEO and a good head of HR, how do we make sure we have a great you know, uh, CFO and a great person in supply chain and a great head of sales, right? Because great teams win, right? And so you, we spend a lot of time on that. We, we bring in our companies, and we do a lot of stuff with our portfolio, but we bring them in twice a year. We, they meet with, with Jack and, and McNerney and Terry, and we spend three hours where we spend the first hour literally just talking about the team. Do we have the right team on the field to go attack the issues that we want to go attack? And then we spend the next couple hours talking about strategy. And you get in that rhythm every six months, right, you can, you can start improving the team. The other thing I want to go back to what Andrew said is that, you know, private equity used to be very much of a win-lose game. You know, I'm going to be compete in an auction, I'm going to win, and you're going to lose, right? Our industry's changed in that respect some, too. You know, we can be we can really be solution capital to companies, right, to management teams or to big corporations. You know, we've done seven carve-outs now in the last 
six years, we've bought businesses and the corporations have stayed in and own 40%. And it's a real partnership transaction, right? They weren't looking to just sell the business and maximize the last dollar, right? They were looking to solve a problem that they had, right? And and then we, you know, we would carve out a business, they would still own 40%, we'd be on the board together, and then we might be able to do some things that they couldn't do, right? We obviously could reset the incentive plan in a way that they can't, right? We can bring in new management team, we can do acquisitions, we can supply capital to a business where they didn't want to supply capital to. So we've done that with John Deere, we've done it with Tyco, we've done it with Ingersoll Rand, ITW, a whole bunch of large companies. And if you went and talked to Sam Allen at John Deere, he'd be the first to say like, private equity did something for me that I couldn't do in my own business because this was a small subsidiary and that these guys by carving it out and, it, and supplying the right incentives and, and management team could go do something different. So all those factors, I think, allow private equity to add value and allow the operating capabilities and to add value. So, Jim, I might add yeah. to that, that I think that the twist, and we observe the great models that uh, Scott and David have put together and the success of those models, and I think the twist is when we looked at it, we saw we, we thought, let's just have partners. Let's not call each other operators or investors. You're a partner of the firm. And when you go talk to that middle market company, that entrepreneur, that family, um, let's talk about how we can add value to your business before we talk about valuation. Um, our observation is um, it's a big market to play in, um, that companies are looking for that value-added advice, whether it's at larger size companies or that mid-market company who haven't had the benefit of someone who is a C-level larger company. Saw my partner Tom Meredith walk in the room. I mean, he did some amazing things for Dell and their supply chain. And those lessons, when you extend them to that middle market company, are uh, pretty pretty valuable. So I think we all kind of find our way to, to the almost similar path, a little different way to get there. Um, I will say, for, for our model, usually it's kind of us or nothing. It's not us versus four or five others. It's a decision of, do I want a partner or not? And if so, hopefully we can position ourselves as a partner of choice. <laughs> so I, I do want to compliment the entire industry for not doing everything that's possible to be done in every deal so that you've allowed there to be a whole secondary LBO market as you trade these assets among each other. So, John, a, a, l a large part of, of what benefits some of these organizations is they're, is they're certainly chasing whole companies and buying whole companies. Now, a lot of what Barings is doing is, is financing companies that need money for things or projects. Infrastructure is very different than doing a, an LBO of a retail concern. How, how, and what kind of network and how do you originate those opportunities? Yeah, so um, we, we have a, you know, for, for people who don't know Barings, um, $300 billion asset manager, we can provide capital up and down um, the capital stack, whether it's short-term capital that you need or private equity capital and, and everything in between. And we have a, a big part of the business is um, private debt, which comes in a number of different forms. It can be a very traditional corporate private placement where um, we're working with a, a large corporation who needs um, to get a financing done quickly and they don't want to take it to the market. Or we can provide financing to um, sponsors, um, other private equity firms who are, are looking for capital to get a deal. We have a, a growing infrastructure debt business as well. And so, um, you know, I think that, that means a lot of things for us. I mean, it certainly means there's, there's a number of um, potential conflicts within the business that we need to manage, but it also means we're seeing a lot of deal flow um, and we're seeing trends um, across a lot of different industries that are, we're really focused on capturing that data and using that to drive our, our thematic research. Where do we want to be going? Where do we see other people doing interesting things? Where do we see other people doing things that looks a little scary um, to us? And, and so I think having the, the capabilities within one firm to provide a number of different um, capital types lets us expand the universe um, of companies that we're touching um, and ultimately be really thoughtful about creating the risk return within any one investment opportunity that we think is, is gonna deliver the best outcome to our investors. Okay, now, Virginia, a related question. So, at your firm, there's about seven, if I remember right, about seven different investment product types, if you will. Yeah, team. A couple of you, you've acquired. Team, yeah. You see them as, as a range across the capital structure or a range across the life cycle of these companies or maybe combinations of risk and reward so that you have a full menu for investors. How do, how do you manage that? 
Well, it's sort of um, all of the above. I mean, we were born as uh, an equity investor. I mean, that's, that's our DNA. We, we, we like to be partner of reference to management team, entrepreneur. If you go into you know, the debt business, I think volume matters. Um, so we, we were born as an equity investor and we felt in order to provide to our shareholder, being a publicly quoted company, um, the full span of you know, possible returns, we would then be you know, able to start you know, small in terms of you know, partnering with venture type of companies while you know, being a partner all, all across the lifespan of a company possibly. Um, but it's a very different ecosystem to be investing in large cap or investing in venture and growth. You need different talents, talent pool. Um, it, it, it's a different ecosystem, it's a different way of supporting, managing, even diligencing an investment. And we felt we would be better equipped um, with dedicated investment team and talents so that uh, we would, you know, across a the, the, the large span become the partner of reference, so out of um, 15 billion, which is what we are today, both balance sheet and third party money, 70% of that is you know, equity investment direct in companies, either minority or majority, that doesn't really matter. If it's venture, by definition, you're a minority partner because you're one amongst a number. You don't want to be on your own financing you know, a, a startup. You want to be partner, and actually, it brought to us a different mindset. I think in mid to large cap, we, we used to be pretty competitive, and you know, being owning companies on our own. Although DNA, I mean CDNR, we made some investment together years ago in 2005 as co-partner. I'm a great believer of partnering on those, you know, those investments. You're way stronger. Not too many cooks in the kitchen, though, because when it starts to be difficult, you have to be you know, two is already you know, something to manage, but I think being partners has brought a lot of, you know, power and vision to the companies. I think being very dedicated to equity investments, um, we've been able to add another layer of competence, which has not yet been touched base in this panel, which is digital. Um, Every investment that we've, make, we've made now, uh, we've completely changed the way we're diligencing the analysis of those companies. At least we are trying to. We're trying to have new partners, new, new, new tools to understand you know, how strong a company is doing, you know, go on you know, social networks, get as much data as you can, and you would be surprised of what you actually access. <laughs> um, then the question is the judgment that you have on that data. Um, as soon as we're an uh, investor in a company, the first question we ask, you know, the management and ourselves, how can we disrupt the way that the company is effectively doing its business? So the disruption that you have, you know, to, to, you have to drive the disruption rather than, you know, uh, be, the, you know, be the, you know, the object of the disruption itself. It's a complete change of mind. We've hired, you know, digital, talents at Eurasio because you have to, you, you can't continue. So I think all the building blocks that we were describing earlier are, are you know, essentially part of our industry now, operations, supply chain, international buildups. And there's this new layer now, which is probably digital and ESG as well, that you have to bring to the table big time to your companies, to yourself as well, um, but to be you know, winners rather than you know, being disrupted. Well, one thing, um, a, a goal that, that I have, and, and because I think it's just bringing truth, is how hard the private equity industry has to work to do what they do. Because they've been so successful for so long, outside of having economists wonder what they missed in class about perfect markets catching up with you, because they've been so good, we begin to think of the business as, as a money, money printing machine. But in reality, there's a lot of work there. I want to go to a slide. Um, which is slide four, which might be an eye opener for people, which is the gold at the bottom is the amount of M&A activity that's represented by financial sponsors or private equity, and the rest of the bar is what's going on with corporates. So one of the, the things that you think about when you're talking about dry powder, driving up multiples, uh, you know, spending money on stupid stuff, is that you're blaming 
the people in the headlines for doing all that when the majority of, of the acquisition activity out there is still, is still uh, corporate M&A. And um, so one interesting statistic, and it might have been a Bain study, and if not, I'll just say it was a bunch of smart people, that uh, less than 20 percent of the acquisition or investment opportunities that private equity should be seeing, they're seeing. Uh, that's an indictment of, of, of my entire profession as being an agent in this field. So maybe starting now with David, are you, do you feel that you have enough access to the opportunities out there, or do you feel that uh, it's a little bit of you got to get lucky once in a while? Well, look, we would always love for bankers to bring us more proprietary ideas. So if BMO wants to do that, that would be great for us. Um, you know, I think, look, that chart, the chart that you just showed about the M&A, to, to us, we love corporate M&A because corporate M&A is going to lead to divestitures, right? And um, to us, it, it's CEO change and corporate M&A. Those tend to be the two things that lead to the most divestitures in the marketplace. And so the fact that there's a lot of M&A going on right now, we think, is going to be very beneficial to the private equity industry over the next four or five years because you're going to buy things that either you're, they're going to buy things and then divest the whole thing. We see that all the time, right? We kind of laugh. We'll see someone do a deal and we'll say, well, that'll be, that'll be a private equity deal in a couple of years. Or they'll buy a bigger b business and they'll say, well, we don't really need this piece, right? Can we get rid of it? So, um, so you know, we tend to think that M&A is very good. And we, you know, we work hard sourcing trying to find activities. That's, you know, if you think about what, you know, what the skill set of, of all of our firms are, Right. One is we've got to be really good at sourcing. Now, we all take different approaches, right? We tend to spend a lot of time with corporates and trying to find situations where they might want to divest in an asset, or we spend a lot of time with families trying to figure out if they would want our capital to provide. But every one of us on this stage and every private equity firm spends, you know, could always get better for sure, but a lot of time sourcing. Obviously, you know, we got to be good investors, so we got to be good at judging the value of businesses and structuring transactions and then we got to be good owners right we got to be great owners of businesses and try to drive value in the ownership and look the last thing that private equity has too is we got to be good sellers right i mean that's part of the way you make money in private equity right and again harder in the public markets but there i'm sure there have been many times in scott's history where you know he's made he's made an extra turn or something because they were really smart in the way they exited a business and you know versus just selling a stock i mean obviously we all exit through the public markets but we got to be smart sellers as well. And if you think about, those are multiple levers, right, that we have in our business to try to make money for our investors. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to buy the right businesses at the right price. We're trying to drive value in those businesses every day that we own them. And then we're trying to be really smart about when we get out of those businesses and try to maximize, maximize value, which I think begs an interesting question around these long-dated funds that are kind of cr cropping up in our market. and and potentially going to cause some disruption um, because they're, you know, they're lower fees, they're people th expect or have kind of given permission to have lower returns on them. Mm -hmm. And um, and with this idea that, you know, you can you can compound money for 10 years at 14 percent versus five years at 20 percent, you know, you'd rather have the 14, 10 years of 14. But that's not that easy either. Right. Um, and uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over over time. Well, I've, I've been waiting to become a private equity guy if the trend was to expect lower and lower returns at the same fee level. But unless that happens, I'll just have to stay in my courage job. <laughs> Scott, do you have anything to add to what David had yeah, to say? Yeah, you know, look, I, I, I think David's exactly right. I, um, uh, I think as we look at the business model of our industry, it is much more labor intensive than it was when actually any of us started uh, in this uh, business. The uh, need to be able to identify in interesting opportunities, first by trying to figure out where there really is secular growth in this economy, is something that is labor a labor intensive exercise. The from CDNR's perspective, or any of the, uh, our firm's perspective, the ability to go out, be there first, be there often, as we uh, we like to say, and provide a solution is something that requires an enormous amount of work and time. Uh, as we look at it, the average deal that we did in our last fund had gestation, well, the range of gestation periods was one to five years. I mean, it's not a simple exercise anymore of just bidding in auctions. We, we bid in lots of auctions. I have nothing against them. As I said, we unfortunately have uh, been losing a lot. But, uh, you know, we'll 
we'll continue to do the work that we need to identify things, and that, that has a high labor of intensity on the sourcing side, which when you add it to what we talked about earlier on the operating side means the business model of our firms has had to evolve. Um, the, the need to provide uh, co-invest for LPs, that's now part of our core business model. And that is another uh, uh, positive in many ways, but it also requires another form of labor intensity in order to make that a successful uh, exercise. So the business model of the industry has evolved a lot since the really early 1980s when sellers hadn't figured out that if you sell something at six or seven times and somebody puts 90 to 99 percent leverage on it, they're going to make a lot of money. Uh, that, was a, that was a great period, uh, but that's not the world that we live in today. And then the last thing I would say is as you look at that chart of um, M&A and that shows the supply side of companies. Uh, available to the demand that private equity has. It's not clear to me where people put uh, the acquisitions that are executed by the companies that we own. And uh, one of the things that I think private equity has gotten very good at is being able to help companies create the capability to successfully integrate acquisitions and do so in ways that allow you to synergize down and not just use the words but actually achieve a much lower uh, effective entry point than the price that, that you see on those um, multiple mm -hmm. pages. And I would say that th throughout the industry that has become a very important element in terms of marrying operating capability and sourcing in order to mitigate the price issues that you showed on that very first chart you put up. Maybe just to add, just to give you everyone a sense of the world we live in and picking up what Scott said. Um, talking to a very senior person in one of the banks we're working with on a transaction, and uh, said, how's it going? I said, great. He said, so are you paying a 13 multiple with an eight leverage? I, I said, no. I said, I said we're, um, we're paying like a seven-ish multiple with four-ish leverage. And he said, that's great. What's wrong with the company? <laughs> so, so just to give everyone a sense of the world we live in today versus the world I think, Scott, when you were pioneering the business, and um, a, lot, a lot's changed, and, and I think it's very interesting to see that evolution um, but I, but I do think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there at different parts of the spectrum. Well, Andrew, you just, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, there's, there's a very natural way to, to have, uh, you know, to nurture your deal flow. I mean, sometimes we're known for what we've done rather than known for who we are. And I think that's a good thing. Like, they, they, they've not heard about Eurasia or CDNR, but they know what, what investment we've made and they, you know, some realize that you were the one to take that company from A to B. You were the one to do some you know, of the build-ups that we're, we're mentioning. And that's the best way to nourish your deal flow because you, you're known as you know, the owner who made that <coughs> you know, change in an industry or for one company. And that's, that's how a number of you know, entrepreneur and management team come to you as an investor because they, they've heard about what you did. So I think the more you spend time in a sector or an industry, the more you should continue to spend time in that sector or, or that industry, unless there's a big change which then completely change the way you see the opportunity and, and your capacity to make the change. Uh, you're way more knowledgeable, you ask the right question, you can be you know, on the go and make a decision in a very short period of time because you're, you've become maybe not an expert, but you certainly know what to look for in your own due diligence and you know how, so you're, you're natural in the field. And if you're natural in the field, then you know, they, they come to you as the reference shareholder or, or partner. Um, that's you know that's an that's the best way you know to create value in the future. So spend a lot of time in an area where you've already been successful, and demonstrated your success. Well, it's always been. We talked about this you and I earlier. There's a European um, cultural approach to recognizing the longevity of a family brand, for example, and and uh, the continuity and your and your. When you're investing, you're investing in that person. So, you know, Andrew, sometimes that person goes from Lindsey Goldberg and then starts a new fund. So you have a couple of things that, that uh, you could bring to the, to the audience as well as the rest of us up here. Um, how much of the brand travels when you're leaving one firm and you're starting 
your new one, and how much does uh, the starting of a new a new fund uh, is it an opportunistic play to to fill in a gap that the bigger funds have left? Sure. So look, I'm grateful to um, to all those that had a chance to work with who have mentored me. I see a few in the audience here. Um, it's people like Tom Meredith sitting here in the middle, our vice chairman at Bright Star Corp. It's someone who's not here today, Marcelo Claire, who's emerging as company with T-Mobile, uh, folks at Lindsey Goldberg. So I'm um, really grateful um, for the opportunity to be here. And I think, look, I think it's m many of the firms you see today um, are, are outgrowths of something else that happened before them as well. And there was some need for it. And we identified a need in the market um, for that middle market company not, not to be lost in the shuffle, that family business owner those 32,000 private companies in the U.S. I can tell you we're having a lot of fun doing what we're doing. Um, uh, we don't, we don't, we have, we have a, a, a big, a big funnel, but a limited number of transactions we want to do. And frankly, our life as it was before continues with the relationship as the start, not the deal. The investment comes out of the relationship, but it starts first, you know, with a really strong relationship. And do we share common values? Are we looking to grow together? So we're, uh, we're grateful to be here and um, feel honored to be on the stage with uh, very esteemed uh, colleagues. And so John, just to maybe tie that back, which is about partnership, partnership with your, your customer. Talk a little bit about the partnership that you guys try to bring, whether it's you know in the debt fund, whether it's in the real estate fund, or whether it's in the private equity fund with the customers that you have. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess being part of a big platform, um, Part of the reason to have a big platform, I think, today in today's market is to be oriented towards trying to deliver um, outcomes to investors. So an investor comes to us and they have a need for one part of their portfolio. Can we give them a broader um, solution? So, you know, something we talk about a lot in the fixed income side of the side of the house is, you know, we can offer high yield, private credit, infrastructure debt, and a multi-asset approach to somebody um, all at once on the equity side. Um, we can offer you private equity, real estate private equity, um, other types of capital, all in a, in a multi-asset approach for investors. Can we deliver that more cost effectively? Um, can we help them get scale in managing their relationships? I think everybody's resource constrained. and um, So if you can ration your relationships with investment managers and get an outcome-oriented approach delivered by one global platform, um, is that interesting to investors? I think it is interesting to a lot of investors. We're, you know, we've also got a great parent in Mass Mutual, and so very often we're in a position where, you know, we talked a lot at the beginning of the panel about governance. Um, a big part of governance for private equity investors is alignment of interest. Um, most often, our parent is putting in capital alongside of our investors, showing that that alignment of interest is there in addition to the teams investing alongside of investors. I'm gonna, because we're watching the clock a little bit, I'm gonna start over on the far left with Andrew, we're gonna go across. And Andrew, I want you to maybe leave the, the audience out here with the one wisdom or the one thing that you think they might not have gotten so far today. Common sense prevails. If someone's arrogant, avoid them. Mm -hmm. um, do business with people you wanna do business with. Wow. <laughs> you should be right. <laughs> that's pretty darn good. Look, that's a, you're like a natural fortune cookie author. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Dave. I'm not that eloquent, so I don't, have, I don't right. have anything to say like that. I, you know, I was thinking about what uh, Steve Mnuchin said yesterday about how he feels like we're going to stay in this Goldilocks economy for at least another couple of years. But the reality is at some point it's going to break. And I think, you know, ho hopefully the private equity community will be very well positioned for when it when it broke. And, you know, as hard as 2007 and 8 and 9 were for all of us, I think the lesson learned from then, from that time, was most of our businesses made it through, right? So private equity was able to react, provide liquidity for the businesses, hunker down, take out cost, whatever it needed to do to keep the assets alive. And there have been many stories in the industry that were successful. And in addition to that, if you think about that dry powder uh, chart that, that, that was shown at the beginning, that dry powder becomes enormously valuable in the marketplace, right? Enormously valuable capital when the world kind of tips over a little bit. And that will happen sometime in the next five years. And there are not that many other places, right, that have that kind of dry powder that can go react and invest at that time period. All right, Scott, lightning round. <laughs> so uh, be very concerned when people start talking about how this time it's different. 
And let's not underestimate serendipity as a key driver of success. Uh, and that old phrase, I'd rather be lucky than good, is very underappreciated uh, in uh, many industries. <laughs> All right, John. Uh, I would say price the world that we're living in. Um, if somebody on my team brings me a model and it doesn't have a stress test for a recession happening over the next five to seven years, refinancing costs going up, exit multiples being lower than entry multiples, I just hit delete on my inbox and you know they come back and ask me what do you think about my model and i say try again you got to price the world we're in all right version eight clean up i would say be contrarian i love to be on my own on a situation the more i'm heavily criticized the more i think i'm right um you know be be proud of what we do and then returns will come out of that all right so i'll finish up in front of us, we have five people. That'd be a decent-sized jazz band <laughs> in honor of Gibson <laughs> filing bankruptcy. I want to remember that the nature of private equity is the orchestration of a song, which is effectively playing the asset, the economy, to make music out of what's out there. And when you look at these, these investors up here, as well as the others that are not up here today, think of them as playing different instruments in different ways, and the orchestration comes together to make beautiful music. Thank you very much. Bravo. <laughs>